I'm going to get medieval on your ass is now in the Oxford English Dictionary. Who'd have thought it? But it's come to stand for backwardness and for brutality. I, When I was writing about Elizabethan England a number of years ago, 15 years ago, I discovered that really nobody had done as much for torture as the Elizabethans. In England, traditionally, we do not torture people for political purposes, but the Elizabethans looked past that and, of course, introduced torture. So what Marcellus Wallace should really have said is, I'm going to get Elizabethan on your ass, but it doesn't have the same ring, does it? Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. I want to give a warm welcome to all you new listeners who've joined. It's great to have you on board and to subscribers, welcome back. Don't want to leave you out. Today I'm speaking with a huge name in the medieval history world, Ian Mortimer. He's the author of the best-selling Time Traveller's Guides to the Medieval World, as well as other periods, and he's now written a new book called Medieval Horizons, Why the Middle Ages Matter. Now, this is interesting to me because having read it, it's a significant contribution to history itself as well as the Middle Ages, and that's what I've tried to get at in our conversation. We talk about things such as the introduction of clocks and time and how that impacted life in the medieval world. Today's time-dominated society would struggle to understand what it would be like without it. We also talk about historians and others viewing the past with today's values. And other profound issues such as slavery, serfdom and freedom, and also individuality. But don't worry, it's not too heavy. We do keep things light throughout. We even talk a little bit about the medieval period in film. Coming up, I've got John Sayles, filmmaker and novelist of the 18th century. I know, I know, I've been trailing that for a while now, but I'm timing it for the release of his book. Last Tuesday, I introduced the new bonus episode, which is out on a monthly basis, the Aspects of History Film Club, where myself and friend of the show, director Tim Hewitt, discuss historical movies. First up, we've got the Civil War epic Lincoln, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Oscar addict Daniel Day-Lewis. In March, it's the Iranian Revolution set Argo, directed by Ben Affleck. So please do subscribe so you can get these in your feed. Anyway, in the meantime, here's my conversation with Ian Mortimer on the medieval era. Ian Mortimer, welcome. It's a, a real pleasure to speak to you. And, and I'm speaking to you having just finished Medieval Horizons, Why the Middle Ages Matter. And I have to be honest, Ian, I, I think I was a bit of a sceptic about the Middle Ages before I started this book, but you've turned me. Really? Oh, well, thank you very much for asking me to chat about it. But I'm even happier to hear that I might have turned you. I mean, the, the book is about, to my mind, as a historian who's dealt with the Middle Ages for such a long time, about blindingly obvious things. And yet I seem to be alone in thinking they're blindingly obvious. Yes, there are two, I think, uh, two or three authors early on in, in the book that you um, you take issue with with what they've said about the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. And there are assumptions that you're sort of challenging throughout right to the very end, uh, the conclusion, where, you know, we, we, we I guess it's best summed up uh, by the words of Marcellus Wallace in Pulp Fiction where he's going to get medieval on someone's... I'm not going to try the accent. That I don't yeah, want to I can't even do it either. But, but we all know what this... That line is now in the Oxford English Dictionary. I'm going to get medieval on your ass is now in the Oxford English Dictionary. Who'd have thought it? But it, it it's come to stand for backwardness and for brutality. I When I was writing about Elizabethan England a number of years ago, 15 years ago, I discovered that really nobody had done as much for torture as the Elizabethans. In England, traditionally, we do not torture people for political purposes, but the Elizabethans looked past that and, of course, introduced torture. So what Marcellus Wallace should really have said is, I'm going to get Elizabethan on your ass, but it doesn't have the same ring, does it? It, it, uh, it doesn't. I mean, the, it, the, 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 the idea that it's brutal and backward and all this, and the number of times we hear the Taliban described as medieval or, or, or whatever, it did wear away at me. And so you mentioned two or three authors who I do take umbrage with or take issue with. Uh, all three of them are very established professors of history, and that is why I chose those three. And I could have chosen dozens, if not hundreds, of other writers who've expressed very much the same view 
that essentially our ideas of change are technological and um, technology based as opposed to anything else causing social change. And I think if we just look back over the last thousand years, so much of our change has got nothing to do with technology that um, it's it, it seems to me a, a, an obvious and necessary step to take to, to, to alert people to how much our change is not technological and rooted in different triggers in society and demography and the weather and whatever. So the medieval entitled Medieval Horizons I've always been as I'm not really I studied ancient history and I want to get onto that because I know you talk a little bit about ancient history's relationship in, in going into medieval but I'm always a bit unsure as to when confident when the medieval period starts which is the fall of Rome mm-hmm. but when it ends is unclear to me and then you know it's also called the middle ages and the dark ages are uh, a post fall of Rome up until the Norman invasion I suppose but, you know, speaking to the maestro of the medieval period, what would you say, uh, you know, your word must be law here, let's let's assume. You flatter um, me far too much. <laughs> uh, the, the idea of a middle age really comes from Petrarch. Uh, I don't know of anybody before Petrarch writing in the late 14th century, but he referred to um, the times between the fall of Rome and his own time as a dark age. And that idea sort of grew. I can't say it it convinced everybody because you don't find, I think, anybody else referring to this dark age until later in the 15th century. The term the Middle Ages or the medieval period between the fall of Rome and our own time, inverted commas, you find from the 1570s, I think. It's Elizabethan times, anyway, 1570s, 1580s. So they used the term the Middle Age or Middle Ages to describe between... um, the fall of Rome and uh, Elizabethan England. And initially it is, they just refer to the Middle Age. Now, from a modern point of view, from a modern perspective, we look at so many areas of change in that 16th century period that it's very difficult to have an absolute correct date for the end of the Middle Ages. My wife and I always joke that the Middle Ages ended about 3.30 in the afternoon on the 22nd of August, uh, 1485, when um, Richard III lost his head and his horse at uh, Bosworth. But of course, in reality, ages do not come to a, uh, an end with one person's death. They evolve into each other constantly the history is a series of nows. And, and isn't that very, sorry to interrupt, but isn't that very Anglo-centric to just concentrate on the Battle of Bosworth? I mean, someone Absolutely. in Italy wouldn't have, wouldn't have cared about that, would they? Well, likewise, for the start of the Middle Ages, there's a difference there, because if you're in Italy describing the, the beginning of the Middle Ages, you'd say, well, the fall of Rome in, what, 476? Um, whereas from an English or British point of view, you'd say the withdrawal of the Roman legions and the uh, collapse of Roman authority in around 410, 420. So there's a difference there too. The thing is, why have a label? If you think about it, you only need the label if you're using it to a certain end. Are you? What are you trying to get across by using these terms? Now, from my point of view, I have always found it very useful to use Shakespeare as a historical benchmark. And because Shakespeare knew nothing of the technological Im- uh, impulses that have led to us having a technological mindset in the modern world, I thought what I would do was contrast early 11th century with Shakespeare's time. So the 11th century with the 16th century. Now, most of that is medieval. Um, Very few people think the years or the 1590s are medieval, but for the purposes I wanted to get across, I went up to 1600. And I had Shakespeare in my mind, I had um, the invention of the telescope and the, the, the microscope in my mind, which are both around uh, you know, 1590, 1600, because those advance our horizons enormously. And until those lenses really had done that, nothing really was on a technological basis uh, expanding our horizons. Ships obviously had developed and allowed us to, to go around the world, but that metaphorical horizon that geographers allowed us to see is really true throughout this medieval period. And then when we get to that technological change, the beginning of the age of science and the scientific revolution of the 17th century, then I thought that was a point at which to compare and cut, uh, contrast. And what I really want people to do is concentrate on everything before 1600. 
So hence my Middle Ages in this book goes all the way up to 1600. Normally you'll find me saying the Middle Ages um, in this country end with the, 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 the dissolution of the monasteries and the break with from the first break from Rome. And so then the beginning is 10, sort of 1000 or not the Norman invasion? No, I I because I, I do want to sort of defocus or lose this. I mean, I'm an English historian, so therefore virtually every source I'm really familiar with is English in origin or English related. But I did want to broaden people's eyes to it's not just about England. I had a, a, an interesting moment day before yesterday when I, my agent emailed me saying that the book's going to be published in Greece and none of my books have been published in Greece before. I was thinking, oh, God, I didn't really think about Greece in terms of the Middle Ages. There's a real um, uh, a failure of my imagination to look to the other parts of Southern Europe besides uh, Spain and the Reconquista and Italy. Uh, but I've wanted to expand ideas and therefore I, I took the thing back to the, the idea back to the early 11th century. Also, because even in this country, that Norman invasion did really make quite a lot of um, you know, profound changes. You know, William the Conqueror came here with the idea he's going to get rid of uh, uh, slavery. The slavery was a bad thing. Saxons thought slavery was a good thing. So that in itself, the 11th century changes are ones I wanted to bring into the mix. Well, I wanted to bring that up, so I'm glad you have, actually. I mean, I found that, I, I guess I hadn't really appreciated that slavery existed in, I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about this book. There's so much information in there that that's packed in there that, that will be new to people. At least it was new to me. But yeah, slavery. And, uh, you know, there are many people who, who view, even today, who view the Norman invasion as, as a sort of a, a step back. But that's certainly not the case, is it? With When oh, you talk about slavery. No. I mean, the, 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 the Normans really brought, uh, British Isle, well, England specifically, into the, the, the fold of the civilised Christendom of the time. Now, when I say civilised, I do mean a bloodthirsty, brutal, warmongering, uh, pope-worshipping uh, series of um, uh, tyrannies, really, because quite a lot of those early medieval king, kings were absolutely tyrannical. You know, Henry II sticks in my mind as one of the most tyrannical. But that Norman invasion did sort of... You know, civilize us in, sen in the sense of many more monasteries with many more connections and much more learning, a connectedness to Europe and the thinkers of Europe, the idea that slavery was morally repugnant. That was not the case before the Norman invasion. The, the architecture, I mean, the, the Normans rebuilt every single major church in this country. So from a, 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 an English perspective, that 11th century sees so much change, not because the Normans changed everything, but because they took certain key aspects of Saxon culture and brought them into line with a much more um, progressive view in, in, in Europe. And when I say progressive, I'm aware of the fact that you know, progression isn't something you can take for granted. But in terms of giving people uh, the chance to better themselves, to free them from the, the tyranny of, of slavery. I do think it was progressive. But then, so we then move into serfdom now, but serfdom is, it's not quite slavery or not bought and sold, but it's not a million miles away either, is it? It is not a million miles away. I wouldn't choose to be a serf if I could possibly help it. And we are looking at a time, um, the 11th century, when the vast majority of people were either serfs or slaves. I mean, I, the figure I put in the book is 85% of the country is unfree in 1086. 85%, 17 people in every 20, is not at liberty to go where they want, to marry whom they want, to choose what they want to do in life. So this is the vast majority of people living in a, a, a sort of thing, well, a condition that we would refer to as servitude. Serfdom is more or less what people talk about in modern slavery, where you, you are just kept for your labour, um, etc. Et it's not Anglo-Saxon slavery. You can't be stoned to death at the whim of your owner. You can't be bought and sold for, for sexual purposes, as many women were. So it's not quite slavery, but it's not much better in terms of labour. The decline of slavery, though, a decline of um, serfdom, is very much driven by economic forces. And we can't think that society just thought, thought increasingly that it was unfair or, or just not the right thing to do. We've got to look at people being forced to give up their serfs because 
overpopulation, overpopulation meant they would either lose them because there wasn't enough food on the manor to feed them, or they would have to try and keep them by founding markets on their manors and putting them to other uses and giving them the freedom from their toil in other ways. So economic forces really show how, how much we owe to the Middle Ages. None of this is technological. It is all down to changes in the environment, allowing more people to survive the hardships of youth, populations growing, competition for food growing, and people having to have different strategies for survival. And in the course of the Middle Ages, that ultimately led to everybody being freed by the terminal date, our, our 1600 date. So that you go from a society where the horizon of freedom only extended to 15% of the population. And by the end of this period, it's everyone. And I think that's a, a huge, for want a better word, achievement. You know, it's it, we owe them a lot. I certainly wouldn't uh, want to give up my freedom for, yeah, for anything. Absolutely. I think that reading about that was what really kind of grabbed me. Almost, you know, you, you start when you think about that. And then I, what I was also looking into, I mean, obviously the Black Death was was rather an important development. I, I guess I use that word advisedly. <laughs> That's a bit of an but... understatement, a bit, a bit of an important <laughs> development. I think I describe it in the book. I can't remember if it's this book or a previous book I've written uh, where I described it as the most important thing that's happened in recorded history. Um, and the only times that anybody's ever corrected me on that is to add in Europe, because, of course, if you're uh, in certain parts of the world, there have been more devastating moments. And I think if you're in Mexico, you might say that the arrival of Cortes and his clan was a bit of a devastating moment. Um, yeah, for Europeans, it's the most extraordinary cataclysmic event. But there are silver linings to it. And a lot of the breakdown of serfdom is due to the economic opportunities of the Black Death. Very simply, if you've got X number of assets and you halve the number of people who own them, well, even the people at the bottom of the, the pile, but the bottom of your social hierarchy, are going to benefit in some small way. And likewise, the people who are exploiting those who are now dead, they are going to suffer. So we do actually see um, a significant lessening of inequality in, in this period. As you'll know from the book, inequality is one of those difficult, difficult historical questions I have tried to tackle. And the Black Death is one where you can see shifts of income inequality getting better and unfortunately getting worse again in the 16th century. But yeah, the Black Death, yeah, it it, it must have been hell to, to live through. I mean, with, as we now know, over 40% of the population dying in seven months, you couldn't really have dealt with that and not had some psychological impact that your view of the world and how, you know, bene no, goodwill, the goodwill of God himself must really have come under strain. But for those who did survive, there were economic benefits and social benefits and more of their children survived. And yeah, it's, um, it, it it's, uh, must have been traumatic, really. Must have been. Well, you, you say traumatic, and if you throw in war and, and fighting... Yeah. And with our, you know, understanding of mental health nowadays, I mean, I've got visions of sort of 80% of the population walking around, as you say, traumatised, sort of yeah. PTSD. When you also think how many kids they're losing in childbirth or, or in infant mortality uh, and the huge oppression of the hierarchy of society, even if you were lucky, if you're low down in that pecking order, you're going to be traumatised most of the time. And I've often reflected, and um, this is stepping away from the Middle Ages slightly, I've often reflected how odd it is that we so seriously commemorate those who are lost in, for example, the First World War and the Second World War. And yet, looking back at the Napoleonic Wars, which went on for decades, how little we ever think about them. We all only sort of mark the victories as if they're a, a, a national flag to be raised and waved in the face of the French. Actually, the that's an important part, though. We've got to do that. <laughs> but um, I have a good, very good French friend who who knows all the names of the battles of the uh, the, the French lost, uh, and uh, but yeah, the the fact is we don't have that same sympathy for what it must have been like on the gun decks of the Nelson ships as being in the trenches of the First World War. And as we go back further back, we've got even less of this sympathy with the common man fighting those battles and the common people being a victim of those uh, wars uh, and, and more of a sense of 
winners and losers. I, I think this is such a strange contrast because, frankly, if you're involved in one of those terrible conflicts, you're going to be traumatised regardless of which century you're living in. Well, I've read about Falklands veterans who had fought with the bayonet, so up close and personal, right. yeah. which is what battle was in, in the medieval period, wasn't it? You Absolutely, were up close yeah. until, until the development of gunpowder. And my, Yeah. And my my favourite must... quote from the 12th century is, a man is not a man until he's heard the felt his teeth crunch under the blow of an axe from his helmet. You know, that's what's mattered was in the 12th century. It's, yeah, it's extraordinary. Well, but so then... I know you, you do not like the word medieval being used in that fashion, but there is a truth to it in that it is violent. I guess your argument is it's no more violent than any other age? Well, I would argue that uh, they looked as the ultimate um, calamity that could befall them would be God destroying mankind. They were not capable of that of themselves, though we know only too well there are certain people around the world who could end the human race at the press of a button. Which is more violent? There's a book by Stephen Pinker, which is raved about by a number of thinkers uh, called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which basically argues that we've got more and more peaceful over the centuries as we've got more and more civilised, and that wars have diminished, and that uh, violence in the streets has, has, has diminished. And to a certain extent, both of those things are true, but I think he's missing the essential point. And I tried to argue against this in a book I wrote called Centuries of Change, if you've got a, a garden full of apples and somebody is nicking your apples, if you don't do anything about it, well, you have crime and uh, no violence. If you decide you're going to go and bash the people who are caught nicking your apples over the head, then you've got crime and violence. And if they desist, you have neither the crime nor the violence, but the latent force of that violence is still there. And I would say that over the years, we have attacked each other less frequently, perhaps. Um, and at a national level, our wars have been more deadly and more concentrated and more universal. In other words, you need the whole government to take on the war, not just a certain lord. But we have built up latent forces of uh, uh, violence, which are what deter us. We only go to war now when it's absolutely necessary. And when we do so, we are prepared to risk anything, millions of deaths, to the level that you can't imagine medieval people thinking this is reasonable. In, in, in terms of the 20th century's conflicts, they're far more deadly, far more brutal, and far more bloody, and frankly, just as uh, uh, barbaric as anything in the Middle Ages. Reading about the sexual violence and the, the, the wars in Yugoslavia and what's been happening in Ukraine, it sounds far worse than anything in the Middle Ages to me. Yeah, absolutely. The other quite profound part of your book is about the development of individuality, really, throughout that period. And I was interested in that because, I mean, there are some some great excerpts from a couple of Italian <laughs> fellows who, yeah. who seem just, well, I don't know if it's a sort of national trait that's continued into, but they're very amusing accounts. Uh, but that really is a time when individuality developed. And I hadn't really, again, appreciated that. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think many people do. I mean, the, the, for me, it came, actually, I mentioned Centuries of Change just now. The, the, the trigger for that talk was I was emailed by a, a chap in the Department of Psychology uh, at Southampton University. And he said, I was really interested by the, the points you made about the mirror in uh, Centuries of Change and how this impacted on the idea of the self in the Renaissance and how the Renaissance actually focuses on mankind as worthy of study in his own right, as opposed to being an instrument of God, which I'd all written in that book. And so he said, would you like to come along to a psychological symposium and give a keynote lecture on how the self developed in the Middle Ages? I mean, it's got to be the hardest thing I've ever been asked to do because you're asked to a talk to non-historians, but also talk to them about their specialist subject in a historical context when there's no direct evidence to say how the, the self developed. You can't go and experiment on these people. You can't conduct experiments to say, well, this control group over here did this and this control group did that. You just got to talk about what evidence there is. So I had a good long few walks thinking that one through and came up with more or less the, the, the last chapter of this book. Um, but it's been very 
it's, the, it's been rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and revised and honed. And I tried to integrate all the stages at which you can see evidence having an impact on society for individual behavior becoming more like something we would recognize. That's as good as I think you can get. And I call it the individualizing process. I mean, the many readers or uh, listeners will know of the civilizing process, an idea put forward by Norbert Elias about how ideas about ourselves and shame and pride make us behave in better and better ways. So that we, we don't defecate in public and we don't ride a horse through the hall and things like that, which are medieval thou shalt nots. People's sense of themselves clearly has a lot to do with that improving behavior. And modern psychologists have worked out the mechanism by which, which this works. So I thought I'd take Norbert Elias's civilizing process, apply modern psychological ideas, uh, psycho psychologists' ideas to the whole thing, and see if we can establish the, the stages at which people become more self-conscious and behave less like um, the, the mass, as it were, not in the sense of crowd behavior, but in less accepting of simply being the beasts of burden on a manner, for want of a better word. At what point do we start to think like individuals? And there is no one point, there's a whole series of them. But as you mentioned in uh, the, the autobiographies of Girolamo Cardano and uh, Benvenuto Cellini, we clearly are there as individuals by the end of the, 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 the medieval period, by the end of the 16th century, certainly. It's in the 16th century we, we get this self-reflectiveness. We get this writing about ourselves for our own benefit. And although it's um, apart from those two Italian autobiographers, most um, autobiographical writing isn't of a very high standard in the 16th century. It's there. It's finally arrived where well, there's virtually nothing to compare with it from earlier centuries. I mean, people who like doing Wikipedia entries and rubbish like that do tend to sort of go through and find earlier examples scraping the barrel. But most of the earlier examples of autobiographical writing are either about God primarily or they're about um, diplomatic missions or the ways you get to the Holy Land or a certain person's role in a battle, basically how to fight. They are not about that person themselves. There isn't that looking in on themselves, which is really a, a social function of the mirror and everything else we developed in the Middle Ages to make ourselves self-reflective, self-aware. And I just think people don't realize this. Medieval people were very different from us in the way they thought and the way they responded. And this, this process I'm trying to get towards. And I think what I've written is a, a, a significant first step that I hope people build on. Uh, understanding that, I think, is an important way of understanding how the Western world has developed as individuals, a whole mass of individuals. Yeah. Does it have a is, is, is it a almost Darwinian ever evolving of the sort of human psyche almost? I think very much so, I, because I think it does go all one way through the Middle Ages. And I think it's pretty much gone all one way since the Middle Ages in that we are taking bunches of people who are expected to behave in the same way, um, have a self-interest in behaving the same way, and constantly hiving bits off to say you're going to, have to behave differently or you can behave differently or it's your interest to behave differently from the mass. When we're looking right at the start of this period, now the famine was practically every fourth year if you didn't pull together with everybody else in your manor, your manor would not produce enough food and you would not be able to store it and keep it and share it for everybody else to survive. So behaving as one of a number, one of a mass, was essential for the, to the survival of the whole. And remember, you're not free, so you haven't got any choice in what you're doing, you're just obeying orders. But by you know, the end of the 16th century, there's no trace of that, really. People are farming independently. If they're working a manor, they have a very different way of um, farming that land. Normally they have their, their own strips, which they're uh, uh, farming, or in the, the fringe parts of England, they'll have their own farms. Uh, increasingly, they have their own farms. And that individualizing process just carries on and on and on. So you could, could say it's gone all the way down to our own selfie generation. 
there, there, there may be bits where we see more of a mass mentality take over. And I am aware of the, the, the forces behind the French Revolution and the you know, 1848 revolutions and uh, certain movements. But I think on the whole, the grand trend has been towards an individualizing process that is at its most mass in the 11th century and its most particular individual in the modern world. It's also my only. I, I reading your book in particular when you talk about time because it almost felt like time is invented in the middle <laughs> ages yeah but it, it it's bizarre to think that prior to sort of I, I'm, I forget exactly when the sort of clock is developed in its 14th early. century by and large 14th century it's just amazing to imagine what it would be like sort of 10 or 11 you live by the day and night and so time is so crucial to our everyday lives now yeah I wonder that must be almost the most significant difference between a, a person in 10, well, apart from the lack of freedom as well, 10 hundred and, and today, you know, the lack of the, the time being the key yeah. part of your life. Absolutely. I mean, the the idea that uh, it comes from ancient, um, I think it's ancient Egypt, and I think before that has predecessors as well, that the day is 12 hours and the night is 12 hours. So when the night shortens, the hours of the night shorten and the hours of the day left. So that a day, an hour in an hour of daylight in summer is twice as long as an hour of daylight in winter. But if you think in terms of living in a divinely orientated world or or structured world, time is God's time to give you. So you'd believe that this is simply the the, the way that God wants it to be. So I think the the, the in some ways the, the, the recording of time is a a. a taking of control by by people just before the black death we know clocks were being made in italy and in england just before the black death and i think that's a, a, a taking of control by mankind or humankind away from the divine and in some ways that to my mind is a real trigger for the renaissance without time you can't do any experiments you can't do uh, scientific experiments you it's very difficult to navigate at sea and all, all sorts of changes are dependent on it, but also social control, the the way you're going to structure your day, the way you're going to eat, you know, are you going to eat at certain times or you eat when you feel hungry. Or, I mean, yes, it's, it's absolutely fundamental and it's so easy to take it for granted. I'm sure it'd be possible to write an entire book about the changes simply due to a, a mechanical hour blows your mind almost when you start thinking about it now one piece of literature that as a non-medievalist i have read which is obviously the jeffrey chaucer's canterbury tales mm -hmm. and so i wondered i mean that's a great snapshot i, I assume of life in when did he, he was the 14th the 1380s is writing yes right so that so that's that's a wonderful snapshot of life for pilgrims going to canterbury how useful do you think it is as a sort of historical document Oh, that's a really good question. I think it's a great historical document if you're interested in Geoffrey Chaucer. I mean, things like, um, I mean, one of the first things that comes to mind is the, the wife of Bath, you know, the, the, the character he draws there. But you see in his drawing of this strong-minded woman who is you know, incredibly self-confident. She's you know, buried four husbands and took on the fifth young man before the fourth one was in his grave who's uh, uh, basically a, a widow merchant, uh, prosperous, um, and will not be held to account by anybody. I think in that character portrait, he's summed up somebody who we, we want to believe in, who possibly did exist, but if she existed, she was in such a vanishing small minority, there were very few people like her. So in terms of women's history, I think Geoffrey Chaucer has given us a great gift in that character, but also he's misled us quite a lot because most women did not have that level of freedom, did not have that um, ability to be themselves, uh, that self-possession, if you know what I mean. Um, thinking across other characters, there are some very true to life characters. The knight, you know, he's fought in crusades in Lithuania and uh, in Alexandria, etc. There were people like that. The, Henry of Lancaster, the future Henry IV, was a character who'd been very much along those lines, and uh, and George Chaucer would have known him. Um, so you have portraits of real individuals there. 
as to how that plays out across the whole of society, I think in some ways it's the ribaldry, the interactions between the characters, which is the best uh, historical evidence for what society was really like. Uh, I, I don't think it's the individual characters themselves who say, this is a type. I think the interactions are something that is unique and we, we don't really get as clear a, a series of interactions between people of varying backgrounds and classes from any other source. And of course, it's so easy to read that it translates very well into our own time. Whereas Gower or somebody like that is nowhere near as um, enjoyable to read and the interplay between the characters, the secular interplay between the characters especially, isn't as clear. So you can find literature which is amazing from this period, uh, especially the 14th century, I'm thinking, and, and tender and will move you to tears. And you'll find literature which is so alien to us, which is will shock you. Chaucer has this sort of timeless touch, you know, a bit like Shakespeare, no, not for all time, that I think brings across that sense that people's interrelationships then, although very different from ours, are comparable. We can understand them. And every historian who writes about the 14th century will be quoting Chaucer many times in the course of their career. So he, he certainly serves a, a wonderful purpose for everybody who's trying to evoke that period. Now, this this might be quite an unfair question, actually, but I was thinking about this. Do you think there's an, a person who re best represents uh, the medieval period? <laughs> Gosh, I know it's a, it's a that's why it might have been a bit unfair. The, the, the characters who come to mind are people who. Basically seized their age and shook it by the scruff of their neck and by suggesting characters like Peter Abelard or Edward III of England, you're looking at individuals who are so remarkable, they're not typical. So they, are, they don't represent the Middle Ages in terms of they embody the Middle Ages. Their careers embody really the, the, the changes that we now associate with the Middle Ages. Abelard, for example, who's I feel is frequently um, underestimated. Everybody says Thomas Aquinas is the greatest philosopher of the Middle Ages. So Thomas Aquinas didn't challenge the Catholic Church like Peter Abelard did. I mean, in the 12th century, right at the height of the power of the, the, the Catholic Church, you have Abelard suggesting the most outrageous things in, in Sic et Non, the idea that God might be the root of all evil. If God's the root of everything, God might be the root of all evil. Where are the sources to discuss this? And he then discussed it. This is incredible uh, courage, incredible intellectual rigor. But also, I mean, in Abelard, we see uh, the idea that if you are committing a crime, then it's not the actual committing of the crime necessarily that uh, uh, it, uh, deserves punishment. It's the intention you bring to it. And this idea is something we live today now. This doesn't really go back beyond Abelard. He's a man who's had impact throughout the Middle Ages and through the Middle Ages it has an impact on us. So I'd say he does embody the Middle Ages in the sense that he tackled key themes that we, we really would, be, well, we ought to be grateful that he did tackle. Edward III's idea of kingship, um, he 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 took a world which was basically a series of kings, kingdoms, and uh, a king with authority over his people. And when he left this world in 1377, he'd left a, a new vision of kingship, whereby kings operate with their elected representatives in parliament, whereby they are as symbolic as they are directly in control. When we think in terms of Big Ben, symbol of Great Britain, you know, England rather, symbol of the United Kingdom, I suppose, these days. Well, that tower is based on the site of the Edward Bell Tower, the bell that he created in the tower at Westminster um, Palace. In many ways, that, that symbol of uh, United Kingdom goes back to Edward III. His impact on Parliament, Windsor Castle was virtually entirely built by, rebuilt by him. I mean, the idea that a king should lead his people in battle and be merciless to his enemies and yet listen to his subjects through parliament. Um, his ideas of uh, dynamic kingship and throughout his 50 year reign, he was his own prime minister, remember. Now, they are 
he, he, he's one of those people who really does embody the, the challenges of the Middle Ages. How do you take what is wrong and set it right in the 14th century? You can look at characters like that all the way through, people who grappled with really meaty problems uh, and uh, contributed to the development of our, our culture, our, our, our constitution. And they, I think, if I were to pick people, to, I would use them as a vehicle to describe what they um, their impact on the Middle Ages and expose the Middle Ages through them. The other thing I, I wanted to talk to you, because you do mention occasionally film in the book, and most people's access to the past is through films. Yeah. And so I'm not sure the medieval period has really got a film, and maybe you disagree and there is something I'm missing, but I don't think there's really a film that has been particularly well, uh, captured the period particularly well. I mean, yeah. the most famous, I suppose, is Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, where he walks from Dover to Nottingham in an afternoon. <laughs> or And I actually watched a film called Medieval just right. a few months ago. I don't know. It, it's a straight to DVD, I think starring Michael Caine. But are there any films out there that you think are decent, have, have a good go at it? There the are several films that take little aspects of the Middle Ages, as they do the Tudor period, and focus on those aspects and try and do those well. But there isn't a film that does... I mean, history and film do not go well together until you get to relatively modern times. I think it's different if you're looking for the 18th century onwards. But for the the further back you go, and I don't know what you think from an ancient history point of view, but the further back you go, the harder and harder it is. And I've got various reasons for saying that. And it's not just the, you know, the Braveheart thing. I mean, Braveheart had all the, the rain and the woe and everything else like that. It had Queen Isabella, uh, who was at the time of uh, William Wallace's death, I think nine years of age and living in France, being said to be the mother of uh, his illegitimate child. Well, I don't think we really want to parade William Wallace for the purpose of that film as a, a paedophile, but you know what I mean? We get these things wrong and no one really cares for the sake of a good story. It's, 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 it's not the accuracy that really bugs me. It's uh, the authenticity. It's much harder to be authentic than it is to be accurate. You can get your dates right, I mean, if you do a bit of research. And the, the reasons for authenticity, um, I'll, I'll give you two examples. One comes from um, writing about Elizabethan England and realizing in the course of writing a series of novels about Elizabeth and England, how I actually had to change people's nature. If you have all your characters, especially the women, looking forward to going along to a bull baiting in London, and the last event of a bull baiting would be tying a monkey to the back of an old horse and letting all the dogs go. The, what people loved, Elizabethan people loved and would, um, it was the, the the high point of the whole event was to see the terror of the monkey as the horse is killed underneath it and it knows it can't get away from the dogs. This terror is entertainment to them. If you have your characters loving that, you're going to alienate all your modern readers because they are not looking for authenticity. They are looking for modern escapism. And the other example I would cite comes from when I was... Um, uh, I was phoned up by a researcher doing a, a documentary and I'd agreed to give some advice. And she phoned me up one day and said, can you tell me, I mean, we'd already discussed Edward III's role in the, the, the Hundred Years' War. And she said, can you tell me who was the greatest knight of the 14th century uh, without it being Edward III? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could focus on um, uh, Henry, his, his second cousin, Henry, Duke of Lancaster, you know, astounding uh, commander brilliant uh, um, uh, tournament fighter, paragon of chivalry, he's your man. And um, she said, oh, that's mar marvellous. Where can I find a, a, a picture of him? And I said, well, there isn't one. There was a long pause. And then she said, can you think of somebody else we can call the greatest knight of the 14th century? And when you're tailoring your, your visual uh, storytelling around whom you got the people you've got images of, well, you're going to distort the truth because people don't have images surviving in relation to their impact on history. So both from the authenticity and the accuracy level, it is impossible when you go that far back to represent society properly. Um, I, I do applaud those who try, and I do applaud those who do so with a bit of uh, humour, because I think when you have history books, films, whatever they are, which lack humour, 
then I think you're missing a major point of how you get by in the Middle Ages or how you get by in any society. There's going to be humour in daily life. There ought to be humour in history, too. Uh, and most historians are far too po-faced uh, for my liking. I like the the some of the the the, the fun. Uh, was the is it the hour of the pig? The, uh, I haven't seen it for about twenty years. I I think I know what uh, you mean. Is it's, it? It's set to France, so it's the judging a pig for a, a, a killing. Oh yes, it stars Colin Firth, I think. I mean, I thought that was done with great humour, and I can remember enjoying that film in a way that I don't not normally enjoy uh, uh, history films. Um, things like uh, Henry V, the famous uh, Laurence Olivier uh, Shakespeare thing. Now, many people hold that up as the greatest film, um, uh, medieval set film. But Shakespeare's writing for an Elizabethan audience, not for not for us. Um, but also, he didn't really represent Henry V as Henry really was. I looked at Henry V in quite some detail, and he is not the golden boy of the 15th century. By modern standards, he's a repugnant, uh, misogynistic, fundamentalist tyrant. But you know, if you want to look at a portrayal, it's a great film in its own right, but it has more to do with the Second World War than it has to do with uh, Shakespeare or Henry V. I, I think the question, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think Richard III is almost a better because that's just human nature, isn't it? And just shows how human. Nature... Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I was sort of uh, a, a, an event a few years ago with Yanis Varoufakis, the Greek economist and politician, and he made a really good point in the course of something he said that stuck in my mind. And he said that when you're dealing with a lot of people in intense political situations. It's not the the leaders of those countries you really have to worry about, because like Richard III, they have their own inner dialogue going on. What you really have to look out for are the people who blindingly accept everything they say, for they have no Richard III dialogue going on in their head. They are the people you really need to fear. And that really struck me. And Richard III, in some ways, like Hamlet, speaks of that, you know, the, the human nature under pressure, what it is. Obviously, in Richard III, it's given a, a setting. I don't think it's a very accurate portrayal of the man, but that inner dialogue is an important part of looking back at the, the, the certainly the 16th century past. And I think with people in positions of great power and responsibility, we can extend that. I do believe that that sense of self does go back much further with people who were made from birth to think of themselves as individuals. Now, one thing that struck me, and I, I think this is a, probably a good good way to end it, really, is you write about uh, the social progress of history, Whiggishness, but also yep. but also the way we look back on history and with our own values. Yep. And you've just mentioned Richard III there. I mean, he's certainly one who gets judged by modern standards. Do you think this is a failing of history at the moment from historians in that there are too many certain I'm not I'm not obviously describing all but there seems to be a, a a real trend for current day values being applied to the past i think it goes both ways and i think there are very few people in the middle of this this fundamental problem there are professors of history i know who insist in a, an academic purism which means that you only judge people by the standards of their own time uh, there's one person who I will not name, who sticks in my mind particularly for this, who is adamant that we should you know, look at the, who's the Bristol slave trader? Who's, uh, Portra Colston. Uh, Colston. We should judge Colston as a good man because he was good to his city. We have no right to judge him out of the, the, the spirit of his time. And when it came to a number of political things where he and I clashed, he was adamant to only judge by the standards of some of his time. I find this is ivory tower sort of history. And you have to recognize that you have an audience as a historian. It is not just about you understanding the past, if you're a historian, it's about you being able to relate the meaning of that past to the people around you, to whom you have a responsibility. Now, the people around you have their own values, and there's no point in them understanding whether Colston was a good guy in the early 18th century. They can presume that because they put up a statue to him in the 19th century. The, the relevance is, what can, you, what can you learn from this? What is meaningful to us about understanding the past? And I think that the alternative point of view that we judge by today's standards and that we we condemn everybody in the past because they had different standards to us or from us is equally absurd 
The fact is we are, we are doing a triangulated operation when we look at history. We are taking the past and using evidence. We are exploring what happened then and its meaning for us now. But it, the triangulation is it goes through the historian. So it's not just the past and the present. It's the past to the historian and the historian to the present. Now, if the historian can't engage with a debate in both directions, is he really do or she really doing her job properly? The the fact is you have to balance these things. And uh, I think if you try and apologize for the past, you're on a hiding to nothing. I think if you try and make up for the, 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 the indignities of past centuries, you're up on a hiding to nothing, uh, unless it's the other day, in which case, of course, that's a different matter. But when you're looking back centuries and trying to right the wrongs of the 16th and 17th centuries, well, why choose those centuries rather than the, the 11th or the 12th or the ancient world? I mean, look back at slavery in Roman times, if we're going to go there, where, the, the concept of dominium, where um, the, the slave owners were able to treat their slaves in the most appalling ways possible, you know, throwing them alive into pools of moray eels to be, be eaten alive. Uh, the, I, I just do not think that one answer to that question is sufficient. You have to look at this triangulation. The historian has to understand how people were viewed at the time and relate that in a reasonable way to modern world, but also be aware of how standards and expectations have changed. If we don't do that with a sensitivity in both directions, what is the point of understanding the past properly? And what is the point of talking to people today if they don't want to listen about how the past was? We don't learn anything. We're just going to lay our judgments on the past and say they're all wrong. Yeah, that's absolutely the key, because it's all about increasing the audience so more people get involved in history, I think. Well, that's been fantastic. I really enjoyed that, particularly balance very uh, very much agree when you talk about historians look at the past balance is is uh, my one of my favorite words <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time this has been really really interesting and best of luck with the book which is i think out this this is going to be going out when it is out so oh, uh, 23rd yeah. of february is the, yeah. the, the so date I think of publication be, if not uh, whichever saturday is after that all right I, I, when is it? 23rd. I know I'm doing a, a talk in Southwark Cathedral to uh, um, to launch it. And yeah, I, I have no idea how this is going to go down. Well, but I've just put out some of my best ideas and see what people think. So, but anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. It's been a real pleasure. I do hope you enjoyed that. Ian's book is fantastic. It's a short read, but opens your mind. Coming up, I have John Sales on the 18th century, the aspects of History Film Club and much, much more. So please do subscribe and rate and review if you can. Until then, thank you and good night.